Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, looks like we're ready to start. This is Karen and Katya, and I, I think they're actually going to intro themselves. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Um, this is Professor Karen Fisher, and I'm Katya Yefimova. I'm a PhD student. We're from the University of Washington Information School, and thank you very much, Beth and Catalina, for having us here. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for coming. Um, we will share with you um, our work with Syrian youth refugee youth. So. We're living in an increasingly sophisticated technological age, but we're facing the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. Um, 60 million of the world's people today are refugees. And the long and brutal war in Syria has contributed to this crisis. The United Nations Refugee Agency, UNHCR, this month counted uh, 4.7 million Syrian refugees who have fled the country. And uh, Jordan is one of the countries hosting Syrian refugees. I want to bring your attention to that uh, red spot on the map, Zadri Refugee Camp. It, just, it lies just a few miles south of the border, about an hour away from Jordan's capital, Amman. Zadar refugee camp started in the summer of 2012 when about 100 families crossed the border from Syria to Jordan, fleeing the violence. And most people, about 80% of the people living there now are coming from Dara, the uh, province uh, just that province that's predominantly, it's predominantly rural and low income. And in these past three years, Zathary has grown to be the fourth largest city in Jordan. It houses right now about 80,000 people. It's a huge place. Uh, more than half of these people living there are kids. It operates like a city uh, with hospitals, schools, uh, an informal economy of shops and restaurants. And it's comprised of 12 districts. People rely on their mobiles to communicate and uh, use the internet at NGO centers and other public places. And there is very complicated infrastructure at the refugee camp. It's run jointly by the UNHCR and the Jordanian government. And humanitarian organizations work day to day in the camp. Thank you, Katya. As Katya mentioned, you know, we've been working with immigrant and refugee youth from around the world. And a couple of years ago, we were invited by the UNHCR to go there and start doing some work with, to build capacity with the youth. And the first piece of work that they asked us to do was to help them understand how the young people at the camp, how they're using mobiles and uh, the internet, using technology. And it was an awesome piece of research for us because once you go to Zat Tree, your, 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 life, your life changes. You're never quite the same again because it's just you know, a community out in the desert. <laughs> when you check the weather on your phone, you know what it says? dust. That's literally the forecast because that is what it's like. It's totally life-changing. And um, we want, uh, Katya and I would like our presentation today you know, to be very interactive. So by all means ask questions because we have a lot of questions that we'd like to ask of you. So we designed this instrument you know, in you know, partnership with you and HCR and when you work with them you work with task forces because that's how you make success how it happens with working with different NGOs. So I know a lot of you know folks do here with uh, Google as well. And you know, we developed this instrument and then we uh, we did the, the survey with a couple of hundred youth and came back. Thank you, thank you, Katja. And we found that as you would you not know, expect that the majority of the youth do have mobiles and they love Google. They mm -hmm. Google all the time, Google all the time. And WhatsApp of course is very highly popular there and they love YouTube. But they can't always get on YouTube of course because you don't have broadband. 
And it was really refreshing for us that the UNHCR, when they did the survey, when I was there my last trip in November, Facebook was there at the same time, Facebook technicians. And the head of the camp turned around to me and he said, Karen, you're not going to believe this, but we're using your data to talk to Facebook. Because they didn't have any data before to talk about how many youth had mobiles, what they were using them for, where they were going in the camp to get the best connections and so forth and things like that. We also asked them a lot of questions about, you know, if you had better connectivity, what would you use it for? What are you using it for to have to help other people? And one of the great findings for that, because you know, my research is all about how do you help other people in, tech, in society, to what I call being an ICT wafer, we found that they're all doing it, but the boys, the young guys, are doing it more than the girls because they have more mobility throughout the camp. This is a very genderized culture there. Anyway, we'll go on and talk about some other research here. Um, Co-design workshops. Um, the other thing that we're engaged in very much is what we call connect learning. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry? Um, I have a quick question. So um, is it fairly affordable for these kids then to get online? And like, what, what's the data plans and all that like? They hack it in many ways. That's a great question. How affordable is it? Mm -hmm. now, you can get mobiles. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get them, but they, they share phones. There's a lot of that going on. The bigger thing is sharing SIM cards. Mm. Right? Where so they, they use. The they, sorry? Where do they get the phones? If you get the phones, uh, you, you can get uh, different, different providers. They can pick up the cell phones. You can buy them not just outside, out in the city in McRock. You can get them in Amman. Mm. You know, they, there's a lot of hand me down cell phones, things like that. You can get the phones. But the bigger thing is to get the SIM cards, and then you can get those from different providers, from Zane, from Orange. One of the things that's really interesting, though, is that you don't typically buy uh, SIM cards under your own name, because as soon as you do, it has to be registered with the government. So, say for example, when I go into a mom, first time I went there with an Arab colleague, she immediately pulled out a, a different ID to go in and buy SIM card with. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's fascinating things you learn when you start you know, doing, this, doing this type of work. So, um, and then there's Wi-Fi, of course. You use Wi-Fi to get on and try and get connectivity. And there's one place in the camp known as Syrian Hill, because you go there and that's the best place for getting your access to call back, get access to Syria. So for the methodology, so we, the first thing we did was this survey. We are going around the camp doing you know, surveys of just people located on the champs de Zebras where they do have all the shops and so forth, as well as the NGOs and things. And uh, But we also, because I wanted to do was co-design workshops, because I did a lot of work with youth of different parts of the world based in Seattle, but I really wanted to understand how youth help other people through information technology. And we've been doing a lot of different series of different types of co-design activities, and what we're really, really into is connected learning. And recently talking with Mimi Ito, who's a MacArthur uh, you know, professor based at the University of Irvine. And we've also been very inspired to her work because we find that to really set youth up for success, you know, to build youth capacity, it's really important that you uh, work with the mentors in youth lives as well and have a very family based approach, community approach to it. And what you see right here, this one, this picture, this is at an NGO called the American School. You can see the fellow there on the left, he was the refugee translator that I employed in the camp. And you can see the Lego is there, all the different drawing materials. Uh, whenever I go to the camp, I bring all my own materials, of course. These are being 11 by 17 spec sheets. And uh, I always try to bring the most beautiful materials that I can find. And I always leave everything behind on the principle of abandon, abandoning things. And what the idea there is kind of a Bedouin concept uh, that you no longer need things, so you leave it there so that other youth and the NGOs can you know, use materials afterward. And also the idea that they can continue to use the activity, the co-design exercise with other youth in the camp and do that. So I'm going to show you some of these narrative drawings. There's just a few. I have about 48 of these, and we analyze them. And some of them are set in Syria, and a lot of them are set in the camp. I love this particular one, and I was just wondering if you can tell me what jumps out at you. Can you read this? What's going on? All four of females. Mm -hmm. Who do you think the author is? A female. I assume. Yeah. Speak up. yeah, female. Yeah. 
Is it a boy or a girl? The UNHCR, they define age, they go by social age, up to age 25 as a young person. Even though early marriage is a big phenomenon in the camp, one of the reasons that girls don't go to school, because you can be age 14 and get married, unfortunately. They're trying to stop that. <laughs> of course, if you're going to get married, you don't go to school. But uh, it goes up to age 25 because people's lives get disrupted, their education gets disrupted, and so forth. So I typically work with a lot of older people, too. Um, uh, but this was written, done by a girl, of course. There's actually two stories in this, because with, you know, with Arabic, um, the Arab cultures do read from right to left. So in the first story on the right, she's explaining that she helps her mother with technology with her mobile. And in the second story on the left, she's explaining how she helps her younger sister with her letters. But what she mind, means by letters is not just the alphabet, but also learning how to read. I love this particular one. It's beautiful. Two different stories. What else is very striking about this one, though, is that the figures are westernized. Right? Yeah, you can see that. Is. Yeah, they're wearing skirts. Their legs are showing. Blonde hair. And none of us were, uh, um, I don't have blonde hair. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was winter. We were wearing, you know, coats. It was snow, uh, March. It was, there was uh, snow and everything. So it's interesting, really interesting example. This next one I'm going to show you. What do you think the author is? What's going on here? The boy. Yeah. So when we do the design work, you know, it's very gendered. And this is with at uh, Norwegian Refugee Council, amazing group to work with. And the uh, this was uh, drawn by a young man. Let me go a little further and see his age. Oh, you can't see it's cut off there. Um, typically, with, with Arabic, if there's a five, it means that you need, or a zero, you need to add five to the age. So it could have been maybe he was 17 or so. But anyway, and this, this one is definitely set in Syria. You can see that he has Bashar al-Assad written on top of the tank. Right? Mm -hmm. He's talking about, you know, a body is there. And this is amazing because in this particular story, and it's set the second trip that we made to the camp back in November when we designed the Magical Genius devices, this screams for... You know, creating devices having to do with um, crisis intervention and how youth provide assistance during the other times of crisis, crisis information systems. And this is what his story is about, how youth help with that. And the next uh, example that I have right here, I love this one as well. This is also at the Norwegian Refugee Center. And this is really, really typical. We have a lot of this type of example. And if you've been over to the Middle East, you will you know that the roads are treacherous to try and get across for many reasons. One is that you, know, you just don't have the resources to be you know, fixing the asphalt all the time, and especially if you've been in a place where there's conflict, there's you no know, mortars and you know, shells and stuff. So I mean, there's big, if you think we have potholes in Seattle, you should see what it's like over there. It's really bad. Um, the, they're not the best drivers. It's, it's really, really crazy trying to get across the street. And the other part of it is that there's a lot of people with disabilities when you're in a crisis environment, especially like in the camp. You see, when you go there, a lot of people um, who have problems with mobility, a lot of people have lost limbs. If you're older and you have vision problems, you're hearing impaired and things like that, there's not a lot of support there. People, you, know, you just can't go out and just get a wheelchair. People have had the most amazing wheelchairs that they put together, just incredible engineering beats. So well, one of the things I've found working with the young people, they're just fantastic at identifying the different types of help that are needed in society. And a lot of the stories are about helping the elderly, helping people with disabilities. They see orphans, people who don't have family support, family structures around them, and they tell us in their stories how they help other people and how they would design technology, apps, and stuff like that by helping others. So that's what's going on in that particular story. Let's see some more gotcha. Yeah, all right. So um, I looked at these stories and come back and I looked at all the stuff, you know, I so, said, wow, this is really powerful. So then when I went back in November, the UNHCR said, yes, let's come back and you know, work with the children some more. And I thought, I want to do something different. These stories seemed, you know, a little bit sad. What can we do? So for this next trip, we went back, and I wanted to do what I called Magic Genius ICT Wayfaring Devices. And for this particular one, I love this activity because this time, it's uh, two spec sheets together. 
And again, I, I love the Lego Foundation. I know you guys have a lot of Lego out there. I saw it. Right. And for this particular one, and it was really indebted. Sorry? Yeah. Want? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I was really in, in, indebted to the Google response team here um, with some of the ideas that we we're talking about with the work, amazing work that they've been doing over in Lesbos with the Google um, uh, Refugee Information Hub looking at misinformation, disinformation and things and thinking about what types of ideas would younger you know, kids put together you know, for, for helping others. So that's the types of questions that we put on this back sheet. We asked them, you know, what would you design for somebody else? Who would this device be for? What types of things would it do? And then we didn't curtail their imaginations in any way. We didn't ask them, um, you know, what would it be built out of X, Y, or Z, or anything? We'd have to wide open. And they came back and they told us, oh, it could be this shape, or it could be that shape, it could be out of plastic, what colors would it be? And uh, before, where they did things individually, this type of time I let them work in whatever size group they wanted to. Usually it was in twos or threes. And we worked with about 145, 150 youth, and I got 61 designs. And this were just the most amazing things. Um, magic instruments, oh, for heaters, uh, all kinds of um, um, glasses, robots. Yeah, this is one watches. of our favorites. Mm -hmm. um, these are magic glasses that a uh, team designs, designed a team of girls that you see there in the photo. And what do you guys think these glasses do? Hopefully you can see them. Baby. <laughs> well, these are glasses designed to designed for seeing if you have illness in your body. So you put them on, and you can see, uh, you know, where your the, the other person is hurting. And the glasses also allow you to cure the disease. One of the things that we did differently in this particular activity was I brought along the uh, Fuji. Yeah, yeah it's, I'm it's the Max cameras. Back, back yeah, here. it's right here. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do that is because you know, it's like with our phones, of course, we can all take selfies. And I couldn't, I couldn't take um, cameras with me there because you wouldn't necessarily. It's, it's such a low resource environment. You don't know what's going to work. You know what I mean? But I still wanted them to have the capacity to be able to take pictures. So I thought I saw these little uh, Fujis, and I thought, well, let's try it. And then when I got there, they're super expensive. Like one photo costs a dollar. So oh. expensive. But I brought, I think it's like six of the cameras, different colors. And I got there and I realized that you now these kids, some of them have never had a photo of themselves, or it's been years since they've had a photo. And we have one driving mantra for our group, and that is youth first. And I find that when you live by that, it makes everything in your life really, really simple. It's really, really simple, and the, I made sure that every young person had a photo that they could take back to their caravan. You used to live in tents, of course, now everybody's moved into a caravan. If they're lucky, they might have two caravans. And I made sure that everybody in, you know, had an image. Of course, lo and behold, what did, what did they do? They started taking selfies everywhere, right? They're taking selfies with their friends. I think there's more pictures of me in the camp probably than anybody else <laughs> now, right? And then they had the option as well to glue the, you know, the photos onto their design, onto their spec sheets, which is what I was kind of hoping might happen. And lo and behold, that's what they started to do. But it was one of the most empowering parts of this design activity. And uh, th this is a magic car, in case you're wondering, and it can take you it's like the anywhere Google cars. you want. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and this one is really important, of course, because you get around the, the camp, Quite often, the kids don't go to school, especially the girls. It's dangerous. They, all, they always only go a half day. If you're a girl, you go in the morning, and in the afternoon, you go to an NGO. If you're a boy, you go um, in the afternoon, and you're going to fix it just, just a half day. But at any time, only you, you only go to school, school half, um, half day. But only you know half the kids in the camp actually go to school. So anyway, that's the. But the idea with these, all of their magic designs had a very Whimsical quality to them because they all were always about full of hope in the future and building things. So, um, just to kind of um, kind of kind of wrap things up here, you know, amazing, amazing 
findings. We've been privileged to work with youth all over the place. When I work with the youth at Zatry, the first thing I do is kind of an infographics presentation, working with the NGO staff. They translate for me because I'm like a beginner of Arabic. And I explain to them, you know, why I'm back, what I learned the last time. And I explain to them that, you know, the Zatry youth, they're like youth everywhere. They're amazing at using technology. We talk about what we're going to be doing next. And this is one of the most powerful findings. You know, these youth have lived through so much, their families have, and they're just so resilient. And the NGO staff in the UNHCR, I work with the cancer psychologist, they say to me, you know, Karen, what are you noticing? What is different from just a few months and a few months now? Because you can see people starting to thank gardens and things like that. And it's just the hope in the, these youth. This is one thing that I'm adamant about thinking is you know, the future of the Middle East, how we're going to make a difference there, how things are going to change. If you look at the migrant refugee crisis, a lot of people have gone to Northern Europe. I mean, you know, in Canada, in the United States. Hopefully, things are going to change here. You now we're going to have more, you know, uh, humanitarian response. Because I actually I call myself, you know, a humanitarian researcher. Really believe in that. Um, there's a reason that you know these kids are staying there. The families are there is because they want to return home. They want to return to Syria. It's where they want to stay. This is the future of the Middle East. Right, and working with these kids with education, especially with the girls, this is where the difference is going to be made. We talk about crisis response, we talk about you know education, we talk about healthcare, we talk about livelihoods for parents. This is where the difference is. And one of the things I found just amazing is the you know design archetypes. I have so many designs for robots. I have so many designs for watches and the glasses and everything, but how the kids plan to operationalize them, like the affordances differ. And these guys have so much creativity and just so much desire to help. And the girls especially. Can you can you talk about some examples of how that's different? How, how, the how they differ? Different. Yeah. 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 So like you talk about robots mm -hmm. and we work with um, like uh, youth from Myanmar, which is another example of a country that's been just with horrible stuff. You know, of late in Seattle, and that's some of those kids spent time in refugee camp settings, and now working with us in, in Seattle, and they talk about how they want a robot that will stay um, in their the home in, C in Seattle and help look after their grandparents there and so forth. You know, do more like home-based type things, and then we find like in this picture right here. Well, here's a robot, and they talk about how they want the robot to be able maybe to help them with education. You know, or maybe to help them with child type activities, you know. So it's, it's a similar idea of having somebody um, in the art of, you know, like a robot, something, you know, or artificial intelligence and things like that. But the actual affordances of what it will do for you will, will differ. Another great example is what you mentioned of the, the glasses, you know, because you think the Google Glass, you know, is great. And um, I guess it, the Google Glass is actually a really good one, or like think of an Apple Watch. Uh, well, the kids that we work with in Seattle are exposed to media, so they know what these things are. The youth in the camp don't. They don't know what Google Glass is, right? They don't know what an Apple Watch is, but they still think of these things. You know what I mean? And they and then when you ask them, I brought along my, my book here in the binder. I have all of the. Uh, spec sheets, copies of them, and uh, as well as our analysis. Because one of my colleagues is Syrian, is a Syrian information scientist, which is great for that positionality you know, for analyzing all the data. And it's just really, really neat when they talk about uh, fusing, you know, Syrian cultural values with how they'd like to use these technologies to uh, re reimagine, re envision their futures for helping other people around them. You know, some of them, they talk about things like safety, being able to catch criminals, things like that, to catch bad things, prevent them from happening, making sure that people have really, really good information. So we do get a lot of things pop out that we haven't seen pop out from our data that we've been, you know, collecting in Seattle. I just wanted to say this, yeah. we did have several robots in the data set, and this particular robot is um, a helper. This robot would be available to look after kids while their mothers are away. 
So this is kind of an example where this uh, design you know, this looks like an existing you know, technology, but the context is very different. This context kind of reveals the need that exists in the community, and that need is different uh, in Zathory than it would be you know, in here in the Bay Area or in Seattle. And that's a huge need. They have like 100 births a week. Who yeah. looks after those kids? And there's girls having the kids, frankly. Young, 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 young. And they need livelihoods. That's one of the big things you can charge with. When I go back on March 4th, the you know, UN, they want us to figure out starting just one district, just 12 districts. We're going to start in District 7. And working with the youth, how can we help them create livelihoods for the women there? Such a social networking, you know, GIS problem. Figure out how can you do things. Because the women just can't walk into any being you know, a Muslim community. If the women can't just walk into any space and start selling stuff, they can't go out. They're not allowed to go out by themselves in some areas. And information problem. We need the youth involved with it to be able to do the research. What are the. Uh, so, startups, right? This brings us yeah. right here. We titled the stuff. Yeah. So we had the word startup in the talk, right? Yeah. yeah. I call them game changers. The kids there. Game changers. So, so can you talk a little about why? Yeah, so I, I did, yeah, I can't start at us because Google started as the ultimate startup, just a couple of guys, right? And that's how I I think about all the work that we do when I get the kids working in pairs, and the the girls themselves that we have one group that calls themselves Futures Butterflies, <laughs> right? And that's basically what we have here. We have so many designs that we want to go back, and new topics that we want to go back and get them designing around. Okay. From the camp. So we were hoping, Katya and I coming here today, to be able to brainstorm with Googlers to get your you know, fabulous ideas on how we can do some of these things around building capacity for education, crisis response. Remember that first image I showed you, you know, of our um, you know, crisis situations in Syria? Because that's probably going to be continuing. These things are not going to be going away. And uh, certainly, even within the camp, there's always crisis. Um, cultural memory is a big one. Youth told us how they needed to have smartphones that would enable them to, you know, capture all the memories from people living in Syria, what's going on right now, so that people could, you know, continue to, you know, keep these things together. And livelihood, as I mentioned, is a really big one. Yeah. So uh, we want to build some of these devices, and uh, we were ha hoping to get some ideas from you guys. Here's an example of the one of the uh, devices. The one on the right, a uh, 14-year-old boy created it. And it's a phone, as you can see. But the magical feature of this phone would be uh, that it would allow this boy to preserve memories, to help him. Um, I think he wrote, I would help my grandfather capture memories, preserve memories, because he's, he's losing his memory. And and, in, the, and, the, and the town has been destroyed. Everything is. Yeah, in the designs, over and over again, we saw that the kids wanted, um, you know, large, large capacity for storing data in their devices. You know, large memory, ability to capture images, and this idea of preserving stories, preserving memories, came up over and over again. So we thought, well, since we want to build some of these devices, um, we thought this is a good. Um, Good example, and uh, we were kind of inspired by the app StoryCore. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but basically, it's in Google Play. Yeah, uh, it allows you to record um, record stories, interview somebody, and record those stories, and then share them. Or if you will, if if you don't want to, you know, keep them to yourself. And this, we're very, we think this app would uh, really lend itself to kind of being adapted to uh, Zathery because it would allow to capture these stories and memories. But there are definitely challenges. And um, we have challenges with training, translation. We need uh, to, to make sure everything's translated into Arabic. And uh, getting enough people to participate. Um, Karen, do you want to talk some more about some of the challenges? Data, storing data, uh, how and, and basically That's how this data, how all these, where all these stories uh, will be stored, all of their recordings, and how the community is that we will be able to access it. So we are thinking about these questions now in preparation for Karen's trip um, that's coming up in March, where we're hoping you know maybe you guys have some ideas about 
how to make that a reality and how to take some of these challenges. Um, are there any questions on GBC or comments, ideas? I was wondering if you could clarify the term you use, Wayfarer, information Wayfarer. Yeah, well, Wayfaring is a term. It's an area that we've been working in uh, for many, many years. And we use it to describe how people help other people through information and technology. Mm -hmm. So in the past, we've used terms such as mediaries. Sometimes we use brokers. Sometimes we use terms like guides for it. But um, I tend to use like like using the word wayfarer because it implies kind of suggests that people are uh, just acting on behalf of other people. Sometimes you do it with intent. For example, you I might know that you need to know something, okay, and I'll purposely go out and do it. But other times I might just do it more through serendipity, and I'll bump into some information and I'll pass it on back to you. You know, so it kind of um, runs like the full gamut. And what's really interesting, kind of unique to young people, though, with teenagers, especially with immigrants, when you move to a new area, your needs are substantial. Because you need to know uh, how to probably how to navigate the language, new language to learn. You have to situate, have to learn about getting a job, somewhere to live, um, just legal stuff, immigration you have to contend with. You're talking about learning about that culture, probably needs the rest of your family. There's the health care, there's insurance, you know what I mean? There's a ton of stuff going on. And that's assuming that you're probably in the country even legally, right? And then just, and you've got a trauma that you're dealing with as well. And our research shows that young people seem to be the most adept at navigating a new society. And there's reasons for it, the research that based on what I've learned in information science, is that the kids go to school first. And because they're plugged into the system and having younger brains, they pick up language first. Right? We do psychology, uh, brain science shows us that kids are the most um, adept at learning new languages. We want you to learn two languages, it's easier to pick up the third language, you know, things like that. And kids tend to be able to make friends more easily. Right, especially for older women, there's more barriers about trying to get out and they're too busy trying to find a job. So the, kid, the kids have more mobility. So this gets back to the question about the wavering part of it. And then we also find that kids are really good at this concept of uh, berry picking, interpersonal berry picking, where they'll uh, maybe be befriended by their teacher or somebody else at the school. They'll get that knowledge, bring it back to their parent, and then they go out and they'll find another adult or another mentor, get back to connected learning framework that I mentioned. And if, so they kind of go around, they get all this you know, good nuggets of information that they bring back to the family, and they'll meet you know, other kids and get involved. So they're just really, really good at wayfaring. And it's, it's really complex because with the kids, we'll find that they'll do this wayfaring, but it's navigating for their parents on uh, really complex information settings such as banking or it could be um, healthcare situations. So they'll, um, they could be providing information back about situations that the kid really doesn't really know that much about, so such as diabetes, you know. And they don't understand, um, you know, medical treatments, and they could easily misinterpret uh, that extra zero that needed to be at, needed to be added for that prescription or something. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like the a lot of mistranslation could occur around it. They say that, but um, a research now by and all shows that kids played extremely vital roles, especially you know immigrant refugee youth, in uh, supporting you know, the all the changes that are going on in society today. And they do a lot of unpaid work, especially in social systems such as schools, because most teachers only speak one language. Look how big classrooms are and how different they are. Right? And see other kids who are doing all this work. Amazing work. A question about the app that you guys were yes, talking about. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, Let me go back from this. this yeah. One. I think StoryCorps, do you guys know StoryCorps? It's like a really beautiful it's amazing, project. Isn't it? yeah. yeah. So, um, just like a quick background, it's partly sponsored by NPR, um, National Public Radio. So a lot of these stories that people, just regular people, will record across the country, the U.S., and then NPR will share them. And they're very moving. Like, they'll put a radio booth. They have one in the yeah. San Francisco Public Library, and they had one at a Smithsonian for a while. And, like, 
you hear stories of like conversations between grandparents and their grandkids and family stories that you've never heard but they've never heard before and it's really moving to hear their response to things so I think it's like such a strong fit for people recording their stories and right. also I think translating those stories to people elsewhere because the crisis is so bad and I don't know yeah. if anyone can really um, digest that information until they hear it firsthand. Um, but I wonder, like, with the StoryCorps app being such a, um, like, an established presence, like, have you contacted them or NPR and... Yes, know? so uh, sto um, I love the introduction that you gave to StoryCorps. <laughs> yes, yeah, so StoryCorps, uh, let's see, it won a Big Ten Award just, just mm -hmm. last year, mm -hmm. and it came out of a Knight Foundation proposal. Right, and uh, so we've been talking to StoryCorps in New York, and they love this. StoryCorps loves what we're doing, and I was talking with their head archivist yeah. just um, a couple of days ago, and they love what we're doing. They they want they want to see us do this, and uh, they have their they don't have this in Arabic. Right. Okay. And they want to see it translated into other languages. They get requests all the time for StoryCorps, you know, to be. Um, you know, uh, uh, implemented in international context. Yeah. So they're behind us all the way, but like in Australia for itself, it's an NGO. Right. Right. Yeah, so we're thinking yeah. now about how you know we might uh, make this you know really adapt this to Zathery. Yeah. And there's yeah a lot of hurdles, but like you said, it's such a, a good fit overall, yeah, right? Yeah. It's so amazing. Yeah. What we really want to do is I'd like to get this connected use YouTube as an archive, mm -hmm. because we know that the youth love YouTube. We know that, but we have uh, challenges, uh, for example, with training, because it's not in Arabic. And it's one thing to make it available, but we have to empower youth first, explain to them how it all works. And they pick it up really quick, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. And I'll work with the NGO staff there, such as at the International Medical Corps, as well as with IRD. I was talking with the, you know, the assistant director of the camp just yesterday, and she was really, really excited about this. And Amazon um, gave me 20 mobiles just last week, um, so the you know, fire, fire ones. and the. But we had to go to the camp, and my colleague, who's Syrian, he's translating all the stuff into Arabic. But I have to go there, and what I want to do on March 4th is just some product work. Explain to them how it all works, right? And all the stuff, and then they're going to the camp NGO, IMC, they're going to look after all the permissions, you know, with everybody for participating in the interviewing that's going to be done. And we're going to help them pick out what questions they want to ask of people. And then I'm going to leave the phones. I'm just going to leave the mobiles. I'm leaving them. But I have to figure out two things. is the access question. How am I going to keep track of what interviews are done? Because I have to think of it as a research scientist, right? How am I going to keep track of what interviews the kids are doing? You know what I mean? Because I'm going to have to just register them all you know, with, 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 with Google, some Google Play. This is like phone one, phone two, phone three, phone four, yeah. 18 phones. We're going to keep two if trouble in case phones. they have problems at the camp, right? So phone one, phone two, and all this stuff. And I have no idea who's going to be using them because they're all going to be shared. You know that's going to be social, right? You know that. And <laughs> it was much fun. And then um, we're going to have to ask keep some kind of a logbook of what interviews are done on the phones. And then we got to get access to that data, to those to the interviews. We know from StoryCorps, we've been chatting with them, that the interviews can be uh, uploaded to a desktop or somewhere to the cloud, but they can also be saved on YouTube, because once you put it on a machine, then you can just upload it to YouTube. So we're going to have to create a channel or something like that. And then we're going to want to have movie night at the camp so everybody can gather around in their districts or wherever they want to do, you know, in their little areas, and watch their families, watch their interviews that they do. Something, right? But then, we, once we hear the interviews, they're going to be in Arabic. So we're going to have to do some loose translation of them so we can get a sense of what's being said. This is what we're thinking with it. And we only have 18, and the, you know, the UN, they want us to do more, a lot more than 18. We want to see what people want to do with this, for where it's going to go. Do you guys have any other thoughts? <laughs> So I noticed that with the designs, a lot of them were kind of designed collaboratively. Do you think the solution will be inherently collaborative? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just going to bring the memes back, right? And like I said, Amazon gave me the, the phones last week, anonymous. Are we being recorded? <laughs> yes. Um, yes. All right, so we have some phones. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so we're going over to this, this is just a pilot, and I'm going to be making multiple trips over the next year. We'll see how this part goes with it. And see what the community wants because everything has to be community based, community yeah. driven with the youth. Because this is co design work. Yeah. Right? And the, you know, see what happens with it. Who knows? I mean, they might decide to get into using these for the um, uh, livelihoods for the women that I was talking about in District 7 with the youth involved. Wouldn't that be brilliant? Something like that? Yeah, they could be on the yeah. memories and stories. Right, the, the crisis response part. Do you want to think some more about that, though? Um, I'm curious so about many opportunities. Like, yes. the use of social media there. Like, mm -hmm. you mentioned Facebook. Oh, are you there. kidding? These design sheets that I was talking about, mm -hmm. um, the youth on their Actually, own came up with names for their own groups. This is so nice. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a future builders group. Turns out that some of those guys look after the social media pages for the youth in the camp. Mm -hmm. So are there, mm -hmm. like, what social media platforms are they using? They love Facebook. Mm -hmm. Facebook's a big thing. They have their own Facebook pages. But they also have um, uh, you know, YouTube mm -hmm. uh, channels as well. And they post all of their own videos that they record and stuff like that. The NGOs that they work with are just amazing. Yes. Yeah. Right. They have a lot of refugee volunteers in each NGO. Yeah. But to post their own videos, they need a data connection, like oh, strong yeah. data connection. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not sure where left where it left off. Facebook was there, um, like I said, back in November, yeah. right? And the, um, the, it's supposed to be happening. I know that there's a partnership set up. I think mm -hmm. Microsoft's part of that as well. And probably Google. Because I think it's well, it's two Facebooks benefit too. I'm like, if you yes. think about other companies like Instagram, yes, like. Not only is it empowering for the community, but also like through hashtags or sharing, mm -hmm. like that message then gets out as its own like yes. gorilla mm -hmm. news feed. Can you show the, the website too? Yeah. Just show that for Pinch. Oh, um, can you, I can, um <laughs> <laughs> you can go to the. I just have a quick follow-up on yeah. social media. Um, how much content do they actually like generate themselves and what kind of content versus just consuming? I just want to go to this screen around here. So the question, the question is, um, how, uh, what are the kids um, generating in terms of content versus consuming? How are you actually what are they generating? Uh, that's a great question for future research. Mm -hmm. yeah. That would definitely be. I know they're definitely generating content. Yeah. And they're, they're generating. Is the question is how much content are the youth generating? Yeah, and what yeah, kind that, of content? That's a great question to ask when I go back. Mm -hmm. According to the UNHCR, they, they had no idea because in our first trip last, when we went no, last winter, they didn't even know what percentage were using mobile phones, right? Or what they were even going online, what they were doing online. To ask them about being, you know, creators of content. I know that they're definitely actively involved because I've been talking with the ones who are, mm -hmm. knowing what they're doing. That'd be very interesting. Right? I mean, I asked them, you know, what types of things would you be interested in doing and things like that? Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt. Okay. I have uh, like small indicators of it, but I don't know the, the extent of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely more capacity. Would you like to introduce the website? Yeah. Um, our new website for this work just went live today, and we're just really excited to share it with you guys. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to put it up there and see if anybody has any thoughts. Uh, if you want to learn more, please check it out. Get in touch with us. Um, yeah, we wanted to. We're really excited about having this platform to tell tell these stories and share about our work. Really yeah. beautiful site. Thank you. A team of uh, students put it together. Students from uh, the UW Communication Department. Yeah. 
So we're out of time. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, everybody, for coming. If you're interested in going to lunch, uh, we're going to take Karen and Katya to lunch. So please come and, and continue the discussion there. I just I was talking to somebody who's um, uh, viewing this as well, and they want to know if you have a deck that you can share with us. Yes. Okay. After the talk, we'll send out the uh, the, the the slide deck and as well mm -hmm. as the, the video recording. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.